lot of us have a uh, like a deep appreciation for culture and, and pop culture and music and and all of this stuff is a is a life is a, a lifetime of work that we've been appreciative for for um so um even like for more context um I used to be like a Posting on Hypebeast message boards like every day. Like I was always in the what did you wear today forums. Like I was in the chat box. Um, I met Josh from Street Etiquette from there and we're still homies from to this day. And then like, you know, a lot of these friendships that was forged on the internet at the, when it felt like it was a time where, you know, it still felt weird and taboo. Like, you know, I'm making real connections with people and um, we're actually homies, you know, and it doesn't feel weird anymore. And then at the same time, the internet is graduating also like everything that I'm learning about the world and, you know, what I like and what I want to represent and, you know, went from being like, you know, I definitely used to wait on Supreme Lines like everybody else. And then we came up point, it's like, why am I doing this for? Like, I don't want to do this. This is not what I'm about. And I mean, all of this kind of correlates back into like your art. And then when you finally find a passion to put yourself into, all the things that you've, you know, learned in your life. And, you know, I, I know Mike C and Eric have their own kind of, you know, things that they learned in their life. You know, if you represented something that's phony, everybody knows that's phony. But like, we don't want to ever associate ourselves with that. So then that's why we take it so seriously. And Yeah, and I think it was a combination of a lot of um, misses that got us to this point and really sticking to the vision. And Mike could probably speak to this a little bit deeper in the sense of how much of the stuff that we did in the past is just manifested itself in, in what Street Dreams is today. On the surface, Street Dreams might seem like a contradiction. It's kind of like this magazine that a lot of the content is sourced from Instagram. You know, it's based off this massive movement and community of people that kind of vibe with the whole Street Dreams aesthetic and what it represents. But if you start digging deeper, you kind of understand that Street Dreams is much more than a magazine. It's about bringing sort of a digital community offline and strengthening those bonds. You know, they have the magazine, they have photo walks. These are opportunities for people to really connect. And in this day and age when convenience is at an all-time high, there's something to be said when you can get people to get off the couch, to put down the phone, and to actually interact and meet in real life. Those bonds that you're creating just become much more meaningful. And, you know, I think that the underlying foundation behind their success is that I think as humans, we just really love to be connected with people in a tangible way, you know, connecting over a magazine, shaking someone's hand, you know, trying out someone else's camera. I think these are all elements that are critical to not only developing a community, but actually making something that has a lot of longevity. I think for better or worse, when we look at things that are created and that live primarily online, sometimes we're a little bit quick to dismiss their quality and you can't really blame people. I think that there is a sense of friction that just doesn't come with digital content creation or anything you share online. So when you bring it offline, when you bring it into a magazine, all of a sudden things change. You know, there's a bit more thought that needs to go into it. Things need to be a little bit more refined and you need to go through the resources, time and effort to bring it into the real world, which honestly takes a lot of commitment. I wouldn't necessarily say that Street Dreams is out to change people's perception that all things physical are, are better, but it is providing opportunity for people to have their work showcased in a different light. It's not about something that's seen in an Instagram feed and you're just mindlessly scrolling through it. It actually has a purpose and intent. And while all the few, and while all the photos you see in the art direction are always on point, I think what's even more interesting is to understand the thoughts and the philosophy behind Street Dreams as a team and how they've come to put this out on a consistent basis. We had a chance to speak with Steven, Eric, and Michael when they were collectively in Vancouver. So they kind of have an interesting story. The three of them are split between Vancouver and New York, where Steve's in New York. The three of them kind of have this interesting geographical connection. Eric and Michael are based in Vancouver while Steve's in New York. So for both cities, they couldn't be more polar opposites. One represents sort of the hustle and bustle and the daily grind, and Vancouver is a little bit more chilled and laid back. But this isn't by any means sort of detrimental to their overall sort of mission. You know, if anything, it kind of strengthens their bond, their ability to see the world around them. Having the chance to speak with them 
it really shines a light on what they're trying to achieve. And at the end of the day, social media sometimes doesn't allow you to really go in depth and to kind of formulate and explain your thoughts. So that's why, you know, opportunities like this are really important for us to kind of understand and dissect what are the minds behind Street Dreams Meg and what are they trying to achieve? The most notable takeaway from this all for me was how do you find a way to both maximize the potential of things that happen digitally, which in this case is sort of this frictionless digital community and combining it with a way that kind of brings it to the next level. And I think that's what Street Dreams has nailed. It's how do you bring people offline and connect over things that are tangible? have conceptual visions and what we wanted to do younger, like when, while, while we were younger, um, you know, Tumblr was like a really big yeah. force in terms of like our creative, like we use Tumblr as an outlet to kind of like, you know, put our mood boards out there, put our inspirations out there um, in the back of our mind. Like for me personally, I would, o I always had the dream to design a magazine, but like, what would that magazine be for? And like, how, what would the context be for that magazine? So um, in hindsight, it's actually a blessing that we were able to release Street Dreams because at the time when we were all on Instagram together, there was like such incredible photography out there. And mm -hmm. it was actually super fulfilling to actually take some of these incredible shots and incredible photography and actually put them into a print. And we're just like, yo, this is, mm -hmm. this is we, we have something so, really great here because, you know, we're actually giving back to the community and it's, um, yeah, it's... Yeah. It's, I, it's, it's I really think this just might be like a a question you guys get asked a lot, but like what, what sort of validation occurs when something resides primarily digitally and then comes offline? And I think this is sort of a representation in two ways. It's like, first and foremost, the work is now physical, but also the fact that you're, the original community was arguably digital. And right. what sort of, what sort of um, foundation is created when you bring it a physical element to it? And I think what I'm trying to get at is like, for people that are out there that are sort of like consuming content purely through their phones, what are they missing out on by not going out and seeking out physical interactions or, or connections with people? With, with technology is, uh, technology is one of these things that it's, uh, it's super convenient and it's so, it's so easy to access. So that if you know where to look, you know, it's not, there's no mission to actually achieve it. And there's no sense of satisfaction that, you know, that when you, when you, when you find something sometimes, you know, like, you know, you can just Google it and find it. It's like, all right, dope, next. When you have something that's a tangible item, you know, there's a whole process to it. So you're already creating a narrative because it's not as accessible. And then when you finally have that thing in your hands, and you know, it was like, for me, I'm a big dork, so I used to love going to Comic-Con and going to get comic books and growing up with that kind of shit. I used to wait, you know, for 30 days straight and counting the days that I get a Game Informer. And then when you finally get the Game Informer, you already know all the games that are out already, but you, just the fact that, you know, you waited for this moment that you could, you sit there and you analyze it and you appreciate it on, a, on another level. And, and when you have a digital age that there's no sense of uh, satisfaction because everything is in immediate, you know, immediate satisfaction, slowing it down and making it tangible gives it like, you know, you just chill the fuck out and just read something and, and absorb this for a little bit. And we're obsessed with that feeling. Because and if, if, if it goes back to being rooted in, the, uh, you know, trying to create something that's timeless. Um, we, we're, we, you know, we're, we're hugely inspired and our backgrounds come from, you know, collecting magazines and magazines being the first form of internet exactly. where that's where you found yeah. and understood what was cool with culture. You know, you picked up the yeah. thrasher to understand yeah. who was the best skateboarder. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Source Magazine, you know, had unsigned hype that, you know, was breaking rappers. Um, I, I personally myself and probably can, you know, speak for everybody, um, on, 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 on the, on the chat is that my room was filled with pictures and cutouts. Um, so we were always immersed in it. So I think what's important to understand and what we're what we're trying to do is bridge the gap between the past and the present and show people that uh, what we're doing is inspired a, by the past a really, because a lot of things have been done yeah. already. So what are we trying yeah. to achieve is reinterpret an old idea in a new way. And I think that that Instagram platform gave us the opportunity to say, you know what, well, we can build communities through hashtags. We can um, take this work that people are sharing in, in, in abundance and, and create something that you can put on your coffee table um, and really absorb. And we're always been rooted in the fact of how do we bring it back to IRL? And whether that be through photo walks, whether that be through our interactions now with brands um, to tell their stories, it's always rooted in how to make it real. Um, and that's because, you know, that's what we grew up with. Like, we, we understand that it's still, 
it's, it's still really deep to make a relationship with something. And, and, and we print the magazine, for example, in a limited print run when it comes to the publication. And it's cool to have something that nobody has or that you know is one of X, Y, and Z. I think that that's what we're all inspired by. And sometimes gets lost in the mix of really fucking with something because you love it, you know? Yeah. And also to add, like at that time, uh, print was kind of like technically because the digital age was like rising so high, like prints were kind of like not really around. So I think it was like super cool to kind of like start a print publication with digital photography. You know, it was like kind of like something new that well, especially for it, the was social, refresh, it was definitely yeah, the refreshing. Space. Yeah, it was definitely refreshing. Definitely. Yeah. For you guys, how much of this of the movement and community needs active participation from you guys? Maybe in the beginning versus now, did you guys need to be very proactive in in creating this movement? And I, I guess I asked this because, uh, in my opinion, and this is me sort of editorializing the question a bit, but, you know, sometimes the things that, that have a bit of friction are arguably more valuable because people are actually committed versus if it's just too simple, it's like it's so easy to jump on and off. So in the very beginning, what were you guys doing to ensure, like, were the, was it the photo walks? Mm-hmm. Were there other, was it just like actively engaging with people? What would you guys say yeah. was like the, the catalyst for everything? I was just going to say it, it was a disruptive approach. It was, it was like, how do we, you know, throw everybody off track a little bit, but at the same time, just create a lane that we felt was more speaking to what it is that we as individuals and collectively coming and crossing paths on the internet and having the whole backstory of how we found Steve and, you know, how, how, how this actually came to fruition is that, um, yeah, the, the 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 main goal right from the jump was just like, how do we make it real for people? And, yeah. you know, whether it be launching issues in, in different spaces and creating issues, crowdsource uh, for that for that specific volume to be featuring photographers from that community, for example. That was something that we knew instantly off the bat. That it was like, we're going to bring this to places where people feel like it, maybe they don't have opportunity to share their work or that they support it so much that we're going to come here and just showcase y'all. And I think that that's, you know, probably you all can speak to that a little bit more, but... It was very disruptive in that sense. And we always had that in our heart because I think that that's what we felt lacked just in our own lives. Uh, so it was really, it was just really for a way to, for us to even break out of our own shells. And speaking for myself, I spent a lot of time in my life where um, I'd never reached out to anybody. You know, we, we, we kept a, sl- a small circle, what was maybe three or four of us. Um, and then it opened up the door for us to, you know, find people that we can connect with because, you know, we all dig the same stuff and it, it was easy to just have it based on the work, specifically one with Instagram, for example. Um, I felt a very personal connection to people through, you know, photography. I feel like that's a very deep medium when you can see what people see. Everything kind of generally happened really organic. Um, I don't really believe nothing was really forced on our end in terms of like what we wanted to execute. And we kind of just went issue per issue. And we met so many people along the way that it kind of just like built a more arsenal to kind of like create new ideas. From the New York side, is like for your, is, this is like where the balance comes in because... The, a lot of the uh, heavy, heavily on the uh, on the Vancouver side is where all the all, all the vertebrate, if you will, like the the backbone of the magazine is built at. But I mean, a lot of this stuff that we're doing has been cultivated over relationships that not not just myself, I, but you I know mean, all the people that we've been featuring in the magazine. Like I've been working with these guys for the past two, three, like two years before even the magazine was mentioned. You know, all the times that we go to the photo walks. Or where it sounds like really cheesy, but like these are the times where you actually get to link up with people that you actually admire their work. And like Eric said, like you know, you can really you know understand somebody by, by you know understanding their photo. So I mean, we're linking up with people like this back home, and you know, you never have a chance. I never was even taking photos, you know, five years ago. Um, so then, not only when you when you start to link up with like minded people, the sense of community becomes stronger and stronger. That sense of you know linking up with like minded people. So that's just cosmic energy at this point. And when you're linking up with people through photo walks and through panel talks and through all these different mediums. Um, so when I created uh, this hashtag called Sixteen by Nine Vibes, that, that hashtag was created because not only when I wanted to be grouped together with people that was like minded with me, but I've been seeing it happening on Instagram with like the JJ community guys and like you know all these different hashtags that were grouping together photos where you know I I thought was cool, but I didn't really identify it with. So when we created the Street Dreams Mag hashtag, people truly identified with that. And then the hashtag had an actual purpose. And you weren't just tagging photos to get on the feature page. You were tagging photos, and then you had a chance to actually have your work featured in a magazine, a print publication. And then that becomes, it becomes yeah. way more real in a digital age where not only you could bring it back, like Eric says, you would bring it back in real life, but you can actually be tangible and you could show your mom that you took a banger of something that actually meant something to you. And then that could be that you're stepping stone into something that where you can use that into uh, getting a new job or getting a, a different opportunity that wasn't presented before from this platform that we created that was built off of, you know, 
people wanted to be in a community of like-minded people of photographers and creatives. In those situations where the community is very like-minded, do you feel there's a potential where things become, I don't want to say stagnant, there's not a lot of challenge because everyone generally agrees with everyone. Like, how do you guys think that that is right or wrong or maybe it's a non-issue? Like, how do you guys find ways to integrate point of views and challenge one another? Okay, you know what, that could be like this or that could be like that. For sure. And I think that's the one thing that I find interesting is that in this day and age, it's very easy for us to selectively pick and choose who we want to hang out with yeah. at the cost exactly. of reducing any sort of, I guess, perspective that might that might be different from ours. What we hold dear in our heart, and I think what we consider everything that we do with for since the since the inception of the project is that we really consider it art. So when we come to that conversation, of course, art is subjective. So I think that that's the coolest part about sort of what what it is that we're trying to do as we grow and progress into, you know, the platform and and, and just the different avenues now that we represent. It's just that we're we're trying to make a an equal playing field where, like you said, it, maybe it's not that serious, but maybe it's more about just the the actual attempt at it. Um yeah. I was what what we're where we're trying to be like minded with people is about honesty. And then if if being if I don't think it would ever be stagnant if you're being honest with someone, you know. And then that's when especially when it comes to an art form where you're representing honesty in, in its purest form, it doesn't mean you have to be everybody has to be a landscape photographer, everybody has to be a street photographer. It means like the mind frame of you know, I really want to do something that's pure, that's dope, and then this is the vision behind it. No, this is not about getting, like, a post that's 10,000 likes or, like, you know, a post on Hype So you know, shout-outs to all those dudes. But there's no... If we, we have the goal of doing something that's pure, and then that's where the like-minded individual aspect comes into. So the work itself would speak for itself, and there might be friction, but then those are the all... Like, like you said, like, you want those kind of moments of, like, oh, man, no, that shirt's whack, or, you know, oh, this design is whack, or, or maybe you could work on this a little bit better because it makes you take it to the next level with people that are just being... You know, like-minded, like-mindedly honest, which is you know something that we all we all need in this world a little bit. You guys have obviously been very heavily interconnected with the world of Instagram and social media over the course of this time. How have you guys maintained sort of interest and or not burnt out? Because I think that we're starting to get to a point where some people just feel overwhelmed with the medium, right? And I'm I'm curious, like everyone has different answers, sure. but like how do you how do you make sure that you're still like plugged in because it is fundamentally part of your guys' identity oh, now, man. right? I, I think what's cool about our story is that it's everybody's story in the, in, in the sense of the way that people are um, looking to our platform and have grown with us to this stage. So I think what's cool about our story and as it progresses is that we've been able to maintain a sense of, um, you know, becoming an inspiration source for people that are trying to get into this uh, same, you know, creative lane uh, for people that, you know, have aspirations of becoming photographers or designers or um, musicians. Um, it's it, It's been cool to maintain that purity. And I think people come to Street Dreams and, and still kind of get that sense of what it was maybe three years ago. And I think that that's a really cool stage for us to represent because in a lot of ways, you know, the culture that we loved and everything that brought us to this point from, you know, listening to punk records and and always having that anti kind of kind of kind of mentality in our heads about being strong headed and saying that we needed to do something for ourselves. Um, it, it really manifested in, in, in trying to just bring everybody along for that ride with us once we got our shot. Mm -hmm. So everything that we do is always tailored to bring back to the people that support us. So now in a bigger business model, whether that be linking people up with jobs, whether that be, um, you know, having more, um, you know, solo shows for individuals in different cities, it's, it's grown to that stage where I think people are evolving with us and they appreciate that that it feels like, you know, if Street Dreams is doing something and us as individuals, even collectively in that sense, do something that people are really stoked on it and they feel that they can achieve that as well. I was gonna say it's uh it's it's like uh Street Dreams for, you know, even for you know, for us, Mike, Eric and myself and everybody involved, it, it's a constant like a sense of self discovery. And then it's uh I think discovery is one of the most important parts about, you know, being an artist and being a human being in the first place. So, I mean, it seems new and fresh and engaging is because we are just engaged with our own concept and we are, we are continuously on the hunt to find something that is that motivates us and that, that inspires us. So, I mean, the, the, even though I hate using that word, but like the content that you see is a replication of that, of, of all these different narratives and stories that, that we're obsessed with. And hopefully that hopefully the rest of the world is obsessed with it with us as well, too. Can you guys speak a little bit about the feeling you guys get when you are able to hook someone up with a job. It's a it's an interesting feeling that not everyone 
will have privy to because you need to be in a position to mm. sort of like find and connect people. But I personally like, I really enjoy it when you have the opportunity to kind of bring, this is probably the worst way of putting it, but like bring money into the system mm. to help support homies, to sell, help support people and their passions. It's everything. Like, what does that feel like to you guys? Sorry to cut you off. I, like, I, I, I mean, I grew up with my dad's as a, my dad's a contractor and electrician. And, you know, being a black dude who's an electrician, born and raised in New York, you know, it's 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 few and far between black dudes. There's not a lot of black dudes who have their own electrical companies at that being a master's electrician. And one of the things that was a constant inspiration for me to this day is that, you know, my dad really, you know, he would find people like disenfranchised men or men who worked hard or, you know, women who were really good at accounting or people that were just good at what they do. And then he gave them a purpose. And he wasn't never trying to be their boss or ever trying to control them. It was all about, like, helping somebody out who needs something or helping somebody out who's actually good at something. And then I look at Street Dreams, uh, for me, as visual contracting. Instead of being an electrician, we're visual contractors. And we don't have carpenters and plumbers, but we have videographers and writers. And then that same kind of opportunity and the same kind of use of your hands and the mentality that you have, that kind of stuff is which changes your whole entire life. You know, I worked at McDonald's, I worked at GameStop, exactly. I worked at Sears, and, and, you don't need and, to do and, that. and it's rooted in the, you know, the fact that our backgrounds are so diverse. Like, we all are son of, uh, we're all uh, children of immigrants, uh, first generation at this stage. So it's, um, it's, it's the most fulfilling part behind it. Um, being able to, again, just bring opportunity to the table and divide that down. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you know, in year three of, of our existence, going into year four, it's all about sustainability for us now. It's really understanding how to take care of the people that we've been rocking with and how, how deep our team really extends itself that, you know, we're, we're really excited now to take the next step and open up the doors to like salaries. Um, you know, things that we really deserve at this point because of everything we put into it. And we're going to always keep putting it into it. But it's exciting to get to that stage to not only give people um, out there opportunity and, and, and provide something for them to you know, benefit from on a monetary level. But I think we're even more stoked to, to, to give our family members that, you know, so it's, uh, it's been a blessing. It's, 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 it's a really beautiful thing to get to the stage. And it's, it's, it's always about that. Like Steve mentioned, it's comes from putting in work and saying that, you know, once we get, we get our foot into the door, we're going to kick the fucking door down, you know, and just bring everybody in with us. So I think that's, you know, it, it's cool. That's in that way. Yeah. The, the feeling that you yeah. get when you help people kind of like, showcase their work like that's like kind of like everything for me it's the most gratifying feeling knowing that like you're able to like help someone out and that person will be like bring their parents to the gallery show and be like yo mom look look at my picture like on the wall like seeing those little things within this whole three-year period you know it it, it hits you in a certain place in your heart because you're like man you know we actually came together as a unit to kind of like help people out and do dope things but at the same time like you're really touching these people and a lot of the time that's like a lot of the fuel that we need to kind of just like yeah. mm -hmm. keep the keep the bar going, um, keep the inspiration going, and at the end of the day, there's like always incredible work out there that's can always be found. So, it, it's not that I doubted it so much as like it's great to hear sort of like the deeper, more profound thinking that that occurs with Street Dreams. Right. For the person that's coming onto Street Dreams for the first time, or maybe just someone that you know hasn't been shooting for very long, how important is it for them to just think more profoundly about their art and their work? It's and like how, like what role do you guys have in like helping guide them, you know, to, to not just think about, hey, I'm just, I'm here to take a nice photo. I'm here to take a meaningful photo. Yeah, I mean, it's everything. It really yeah. is everything. It's a it's a super meta feeling with photography and and creating uh, and creating art, especially as coming as a, from creators. It's uh, there's a reference point for everything from every photo that you've taken. There's it could be a reference point from a movie, from a show, from a conversation. You know, I mean, me personally, I like to write colorful captions, and all my colorful captions are based off of conversations that I've had previous that day. So I mean, none of it is really random. If you really know me, like you know, this is all a part of the art. So. I mean, everybody has ways to represent themselves as a person and where they're from and what they represent. So with Street Dreams, it's not about, like, everything we've been saying. Like, even if it feels like, you know, this, from a, first, from a person seeing it from the first time, it might feel like, you know, this is a new cool thing. As I know, dude, we actually have a, a moral obligation to try to really represent something that's and, cutting edge and like, what we really want to put And on. it comes back to, like, the actual, you know, Street Dreams itself. It's, it's born out of hip-hop culture. A lot of people will have the connotation when you see the word street to think that it is street photography. Mm -hmm. um, it was born out of, you know, th that kind of channel. But I think the biggest thing that we do through the content that we create, the the work that we do, the the, the pictures that we feature, um, the way that we interact with the community is presenting a vibe. Mm. And you can't force a vibe. 
um, we know that, that you can't come in and build culture, you can't force vibes because that just happens on itself because it's so, it's so potent that it, it's, it, it, it speaks through everything that we do, how we walk, how we talk, how we think. So when it comes to like, for example, like the magazine and how we bring context to people who purchased the magazine and are up and coming photographers who may have just picked up a, a smartphone or, you know, shot their first, um, you know, rolled a film. Um, the art that we present and the vibe that comes into the magazine when you hold it into your hands is really about creating an art gallery in your hands. And, and I think that that, when you look at the full, full range of what we've been able to do with the publication over 13 issues now, or coming up on 13 issues, is that it doesn't feel like they're separate volumes, but you have to look at it like a body of work. It's a chapter in like, you know, an, a, a book that keeps continuously getting um, deeper and deeper as we grow as curators, as, as editors, as, you know, people who are finding things that we, we feel can inspire somebody else by just seeing one single image. So I think that that's where the biggest thing comes into the mix with us. And, you know, on the art end, everything on the background is always the vibe and the stuff that we've been inspired by, like Japanese culture, like German design. It's, it's always been rooted in minimalism and letting the work speak for itself. So we think that, that the right people will always understand what we're trying to say. And even the wrong people will stumble upon it and maybe just like really vibe with it as well. So one thing that you guys mentioned is like, and, and this is for me, like a, a genuine passion is like for, you know, the quote unquote youth for lack of better way of, of describing it. Uh, obviously you guys are very rooted in your identity on a personal and on a, on a business level. How do you think that people that are born into this digital generation in a, in a time when everything's quantifiable, how do they find their own identity when the validation is, is staring at them right in the face? Like, how would you push someone to step out of that and to understand, hey, you know what, there's obviously much more to this than just how many likes you got, which is a very sort of um, direct way of, of comparing it. I think it has a little bit to do with everything of but mainly time, like, you know, in order to truly appreciate anything, like if you, if you genuinely gravitate towards these things, like you have, you have to allow time for it to grow. Eric, myself and Mike, you know, we're all of us in our thirties, you know? So we've been, we've invested a lot of time into all the things that we know that we like that, you know, I've listened to punk rock for 10, 20, like 10, 20 years. I grew up into hip hop, you know, I've been playing video games and still play video games all the time. So all these reference points were things that we're truly into is, We've, we've invested time into this. So then that's why we feel familiar to not only talk about it, to share it with other people and then figure out ways to not only, you know, discover new ways to, you know, love, to love the things that we're already, that we're already in love with, but also to find new engaging ways to find out new things uh, and the new things we want to grav gravitate towards too. So And we can speak to it uh, probably a little bit deeper, but I think it's just bridging, the, again, the past and the present. Like how do we keep bringing things to the table that show, because we grew up in a time where it was like, and I mean, it's not too, it's, just, it's crazy how fast time moves and, and how easy it is, for example, for you to be into one thing one day and then the very next minute you're into something completely different because you landed on a page, for example. So I think that's what we're alluding to in the conversation mm -hmm. in terms of identity. Because uh, we grew up in a time where it was like, yo, if you if you really rocked with hip hop, then you rocked with hip hop and you didn't really... You need to listen to the whole album. You and, 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 and you didn't mess with the punk kids, you know what I'm saying? Like there was that time where it was like yo, well, I really rock with this, so I'm going to stick in this lane. So I think it's important for us to bring back the essence of that through, um, you know, the, the work that we share, whether it be the curated work on, you know, social feeds or um, the stuff that we'll share in our upcoming website in 2018 in the sense of that being a gateway for people to understand, um, you know, the art history value behind everything, um, you know, from OG skaters to, you know, jazz albums. It's, it, it, it's, it's really, I think, about giving people access to it and, with, with so much access to information, people don't even know where to go anymore. Um, and of course, everything is algorithm based and it's really kind of throwing things in your lane by saying, hey, this is what you should listen to. I think that there's still a human element involved in that. And we want to, we, we choose to represent that through the, the expansion of, you know, what's coming up next for us in terms of, you know, really rounding out ourselves as a media source for people to get all kinds of con content and, and access to information through an art based sort of channel. Well, one thing that immediately struck me was like your guys is geographical connection between New York and Vancouver. It's obviously two very different cities. What are the what are the benefits of having these two different um, sides of North America represented? And like the general comparison would be like New York, LA, but obviously Vancouver and LA are very different. So how do you see um, this being a, a benefit to you guys? I prefer having, you know, it's so funny that you mentioned LA because usually that when it comes to bi-coastal uh, bi companies, I mean, that's the easy, that's definitely like the easiest way to, you know, 
to get a lot of work done, and they and, it, and it's successful, definitely in its own route. But what we figured out with uh, the New York and Vancouver element is that with the uh, with you know Vancouver is just I mean I'm just speaking as from outside perspective, um, even though in Vancouver, but uh, Vancouver is just a very overall chill and easy environment to understand and take your, like 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 I'm using the word time again, but take your time and really indulge into different things, different obsessions and different passions that you love because it's not the different kind of paces that everybody moves in their own different clock out I here. think I think the, to quantify the thought is balance. Yeah. It's it's really balanced out. So it like in New York is completely different. I mean I, everything in New York is based about your pace and hustle and like when can you get things done and like the efficiency of the getting things done. So we've just learned to find a balance between both of like the hustle of New York and like the patience and the balance of Vancouver. And we're finding like the perfect you know the perfect storm to find like right in the middle of it. You the, know? Mo- the motivation is like Really, New York has helped the motivation for sure because you, you go out there and you see everyone doing super creative things. So you're like, you come back to Vancouver and you're just like, man, yeah. I want to I want to get down. You know, I want, how can we how can we change? How can we make things better? How can we like mm-hmm. enhance what we already have? So like, um, and I, I I love the connection that we have with New yeah. York and and Vancouver because technically, when you're in Vancouver, you can kind of like have the time to kind of like yeah. cool out and kind of just like actually like craft what we need to craft but when you're in new york you know it's like there's a sense of urgency that right. you know that we Which is na- dope, though. that we exactly, na- yeah. that we naturally still have so like we uh, we have a sense of urgency but we're taking our time <laughs> at this mm-hmm. at the same time so like we're we're patient and impatient and then it comes back to you know again what it is that we've been inspired by so mike and myself and you know half of our team as well on the vancouver side the extended side um we've always as growing up as canadians like you're obsessed with the u.s culture um, you're obsessed with, of course, the New Yorks. You're obsessed with the Londons. You're obsessed with the Japans. Um, and I think we have a really cool perspective here where we we sit back and we absorb all these cultures for what it is that we find dope about it. And that would that's what sort of leads the output of what it is that we do. So having, again, just the supercharged energy that we can always connect to and have the lifeline flowing through what it is that we do as a company, um, always being connected to New York. Anytime that we go out there and plug in and unplug and come back supercharged to the city to make things happen, I think it works in the the, the exact same you know way for Steve, for example, like being here in Vancouver with us today. Uh, he's going to go back with a little bit more patience and, and vision for what it is that he has to, you know, totally. go on the day-to-day with the madness that happens on that side. So it's, it's, it's really well balanced in that sense, and it keeps us... Um, you know, I, slow and low. I could I could talk about New York all day, yeah. but uh, I will spare you guys. But the, one of the last things also is that New Yorkers we we care about being direct and authentic with more so than anything. And then that's the main message that we always want to uh, communicate, yeah. like the, especially being direct with someone. And I feel like with Street Dreams being you know partially from New York and Vancouver, we we've learned how to to be very direct with our message and be very clear from what we're trying to display with people. So even if you don't, you can kind of have an inkling, you, you can have an inkling and know what go, what's going on. You know, that's, that's the New Yorker. The New Yorker side of us is like, no, we're letting you know what's up, that this is what it is. But at the same time, the Vancouver side is like, this is the patience that it took to form this plan in the first place. So, I mean, I mean, we can go all day with the analogies, but it's just it's just really dope having, you know, the balance of both sides. Um, is I think it's new and unique yeah. and... A uh, different way of marketing, and you know, it's just a way to communicate art that's never really been seen before. Uh, I think what Eric mentioned is is very relevant. It's like it's, it's very easy to get caught up in what's happening in other cities and to lose sight of what you're doing. Pers, what what's in your own backyard? Mm-hmm. Speak to that. Like I actually grew up in right outside of Edmonton, in a small town, and looking back now, like you kind of needed to find ways to to create your own. Um, framework in many ways. And I think that's the one thing that, you know, a lot of people, they get caught up with everything that's outside of where they, like, basically you have access to what's going on. It's like, you know, I want to know what's going on in this city. I'll just go look at their Instagram stories and the in the hashtag or the location tag. And I think that there's going to be people that live outside the bi-coastal cities, as you mentioned. And like, how do you find a way to get them creatively involved? I think that's one of the most critical things. It's like, you might be living in the Midwest. You might be living in, Saskatchewan or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think there's <laughs> right. it's still relevant for people to find a way to make it their own unique sort of playground. You know what? It, those are the markets that we shoot for. It's the underdogs. It's 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 the feeling that we had from you know, again just just struggling to get to this point from a lot of dark days of not understanding where we were trying to go as individuals. Um, really made us understand our value. Um, I think when it comes back to also just making reference to. For us, like the more that I started going to New York made me understand how much I loved my city. Um, For a long time, we had beef with our city because this is where you're from and you're just like, yo, nothing rocks out here. Um, There's never going to get a chance for us to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. Um, As soon as we get something popping, we're going to move to like Toronto or Montreal. (laughs) We're about to just like leave. 
Um, but as we started experiencing the different cultures, as we started experiencing the love that we were getting from certain cities, it became so much more evident to ourselves that we owe it to this city, Vancouver, to come back and, and try to make something that people will identify it with. Um, saying and that represent it to the fullest exactly yeah. and you know show the process of saying yo street dreams is from vancouver as much as they are from new york a lot of people do um feel that we are from new york um sort of outright but that's because of the face of the brand and the energy um but i love having conversations with people that find out that we're from vancouver and then they make that connection so i think we're trying to represent that that environment within the space because we come from that environment in a lot of ways too like Vancouver being a smaller city, there isn't as much opportunity. If we were to have springboarded this project just strictly here, I don't think it would have popped off the way that it did. Um, so I think it was just the foresight of understanding for us to say that we're we're really invested in powering ourselves up by being strategic with this and and connecting with people that that will allow us to just again add fuel to the fire. Mm-hmm. Um, but as we got out there, it became more and more evidence that you know our our goal is to represent Vancouver and represent Calgary and represent these smaller markets where people feel like everything's always happening in LA everything's always happening in New York and London and how do i get to, you know to these places i think um it, you know especially for us going forward it's it's going to be more of that like how do we represent those markets um yeah. how do we just go there to connect with these people IRL yeah just to, just to piggyback on top of that you know if if you ask if you ever ask a New Yorker where you're from, like they will say that with pride, like I'm from Brooklyn, you know, I'm from Queens, and like we say specifically the borough we are from, and that sense of pride is something that we all have. Like my that's from my mom to my grandma, and you know everybody that uh, all of my family members that are from New York. So why can't other smaller cities just have that same sense of pride? There's nothing wrong with it. Like we're not trying to gloat about it. No, we're just telling you, like no, we we have blood, sweat, and tears here. So I mean, that's the same way that like you know we want to distribute that same kind of hometown pride and other cities as well too to really create these uh these communities that are already there like we just did um we just did my i just hosted my first like uh i yeah. hosted my first uh solo curated show in seattle with the help of eric and the guys from trees and gallery and um and never, we'd never done an activation in seattle before and that was our first one but uh it was about we had about a constant rotation of people all night the 250 to 300 people all night in a space that was only open for three hours that everybody said that they'd never been to something like that in seattle i was like this is not about me, you know, I'm just the guy who who knows the other photographers to, to print their photos. Like, this is about you guys and cultivating what you guys have here in Seattle, like, you know, and being proud of that, you know. And not saying that it doesn't happen in other cities already, but we're just here to remind you, like, you guys are fucking dope and, like, we, we're trying to rock out with you guys. And I think what's what's important to understand and and just kind of throw out there is that, you know, as, as much as our story is built on, and, and you know, like the parallels between our stories as well with yourself, Eugene, um, it's, 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 I think what people also didn't have to get lost in the mix is that, you know, we started this because it was it was right for ourselves and it was it was something again that was based out of a really deep fucking need to mm. make something happen that you don't have to start stuff sometimes, you know? Mm. Like it's it's going to be amazing for us like, you know, in in, t- in 10 years from now in the next 3 years to have people out there that maybe, you know, will work for companies like ours so that we can continuously now give opportunity to the youth to come on board and do internship programs and have scholarship grants for, you know, photographers from, you know, inner cities or uh, inaccessible places to um, you know, go to college and and learn about photography. So it's 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 so much of our DNA and the way that we what we we choose to move forward and 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 kind of just use utilize every opportunity that we get to get us into the space where we can you know just again mob out together and and, and rock with every city. I only have a handful of uh, more questions. You guys have been awesome, like super on point. Oh man, thank you again. Um, one thing that I'm curious for you guys, what what do you think has have been the biggest challenges for Street Dreams in terms of both past and the future? You know. I think it's a, a a constant education process, and then you have to be willing to know that there will, you, you don't know everything, and, and there's a, always a sense of uh, like uh, you know there, we are very confident about what we do, and at the same time when you uh, when you get bamboozled by uh, <laughs> bamboozled from left field from something that you're not expecting or just not being familiar with the overall like you know we get into like these super uh, the language terms of different deals and all this other kind of stuff. There's a constant learning process that you had to be willing to accept that that was the hardest that was the hardest pill to swallow pause at first and after you after you willing after you're you know you willingly know that you don't know everything everything becomes a lot easier <laughs> you know and the, the, you could you could go with the flow better but um it's still like, there's a constant beta mode I, I saw that from Eric but we, it's a constant beta mode that we're always in and I feel like that constant reflection is something that you always have to be aware of I'm, I'm gonna alley oop Mike into this because he, he he mentioned something interesting and it's 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 being more responsible with the brand right right I 
you know, one challenge that I find is like we have so many ideas, and sometimes you just want to like do everything, do everything <laughs> all the time. So, <laughs> it's, yeah, I think one of the major challenges is just like really getting the patience and kind of like figuring and the, and out the structure and the structure and figuring out like the right time or which city is the best to go to to do this activation or like when is the right time to kind of like feature this photographer um because we all of us like we we were all we get together all the time and we have so many different ideas we, we, every day like yeah. so many ideas come out of our of our brains but um yeah the main challenge is like how, how do we figure out to plan those out and kind of like not jump the gun because you know obviously like we really take pride in like for sure making sure that we're organic with everything that we do and being really responsible especially now and as we go forward in like our fourth and fifth year and and ali um, open into that it's really about structure it's understanding how to really operate like a real business um you know a lot of this is from from our heart we do it in a, in a very freestyle yeah. um yo we're just gonna get this done um you know fourth quarter michael jordan kobe bryant type you know we're gonna drop 50 <laughs> um but as we grow forward and we have so many more things to do besides just the magazine it's uh it's all about structure it's all about understanding how to how to put the pieces in place and learn how to um you know bring people on board that um can can help us you know take the workload off of what it is that we do um and i think that just comes with time and understanding how to you know not shoot ourselves in the foot and make sure that the next step is as natural as 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 as, as possible mm -hmm. that we limit our mistakes and that we 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 get sustainability behind it so it kind of comes down to like in retrospect when, when you're trying to start something and and you know you have a um you know this need for it the hardest thing in the world is getting your first shot um but now you know sort of like in, in in context for ourselves once we got that first shot you really start to realize that yo like the real work comes into it now like you need to take this idea and make it forever so I think that that's the biggest part that we need to, you know, fine tune. I'm not saying that we haven't fine tuned it, but we're always working at that and going back to your idea of it, this always being in refinement stages. It's it's it's, it's working in the moment, but um, giving ourselves context to move forward mm -hmm. properly and, and set ourselves up for sustainability. Yeah. I will 100% echo the sentiment that I think financial literacy for freelancers, for people that are just made, that don't have necessarily the the sort of background or, or or network of people to educate them on how to set up deals is 100% necessary. And I think that's really in, something that is unsexy, but I think that the how can you get people to learn about it earlier and at least provide the, the resources to learn about it, I think it's critical. Because at the end of the day, like, we all recognize that quote-unquote content creators, for lack of a better term, are, are going to be in increasingly high demand because that just is the way how people are going to market. Yep. If you guys had to distill, what is the feeling that you want people to derive after picking up a copy of Street Dreams magazine or interacting with you guys um, in any capacity, what do you think is the, the main takeaway you would want to communicate or you would want them to have? Uh, Maybe we can go around and, and say one word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say authenticity. I'm going to make it a hyphen word, time capsule. I would say art in general. Um, we really take pride in like how we execute the brand in terms of the way the magazine looks. So Yeah, so the merger of all of those, like how do we... I think I think it I think it comes across in a really cool way in that sense. Um, you know, from the feedback that we get from people, I think one of the coolest things that ends up happening with you know this being a print publication in 2017, um, you know, going into 2018 is that we still have you know 10 year old kids who email us asking us if we're going to reprint an issue. Um, so I think in that sense, that's the that's the what keeps us driven forward is that we're seeing that we're making that mark. Whether it's you know one kid, whether it's you know 30 kids, whether it's 30 million kids, um, seeing that people are seeking us out to to see that we're we're doing exactly what it is that we we're setting out to do in the sense of again I've said it many times is bridging that gap and making sure that we have the obligation to ourselves to to allow people to to find art in a in a curated format um, you know mixing well established people to the up and comers to the people that have been shooting for 20 minutes to the masters who have shot for 40 years it's um it's about creating an equal playing field and I think. Another key word I think that we could all agree on is, is, is accessibility, inclusivity, and not exclusivity. Everybody's part of this. Everybody makes up the Street Dreams family. Um, and and we, we were honored to keep forward and, and push, you know, more opportunity in everybody's direction. And 
you know, connect with people that inspire us. That's been the biggest thing, like feeling like we're potentially on par with people. We we still feel like we haven't scratched the surface and we're really tough on ourselves and we're competitors. So um, we're trying to learn a little bit more to understand what we've been able to accomplish over the last three years. This is a huge milestone for us, by the way. We've said it already, like this is, you know, a, a, a dream come true for us. So it's, um, it's, it's really humbling. And I think that that's the microcosm of what it is that we're trying to push forward and let people feel and resonate, whether you come to an event, whether you pick up a magazine, whether you see a campaign that we've shot. It's, um, it's, it's storytelling, and, and I hope that it resonates in your heart. I mean, l- the last thing I just wanted to say is family. You know, if we, or we, are, we feel like a, every, every event that you go to, like, you know, I bring my parents to, like, half of our events, you know, and then my parents are Jehovah's Witnesses. Is that if, I, if you can have a Jehovah's Witness, you know, parent, parents, rather, chilling at a Street Dreams art gallery in the middle of Dumbo, Brooklyn, you know that you're doing something right. You know, because this is not, this is about merging all these different cultures and all these different ideas and these perspectives together. I mean, like, this is about being open with each other. This is about sharing and being, I mean, as cliche and care bear as it sounds, like, we really care about all these different human emotions because these are the human emotions that go into creating something that's more than, than, that's more than life, you know, that's something that could transcend past what, you know, Eric, myself, and, you know, and, you know, if once we're all gone, you know, this could be still alive and well and booming. And I always think about immortality in a way. And I feel like Street Dreams is a, an immortal form of art that we can really represent. And then that message can be transcended throughout, to, to the end of time, hopefully. Let's we'll see what happens. Have you guys ever gotten into a fight over creative direction or whatever and like what what was i guess yeah i'm just curious about your dynamic we, i mean we have I, our, really. I, th- I think what ends up happening is that i think we play our roles really well um i think what we always make analogies and we're you know we could sit for days to talk about this but we really envision like our team like a, a basketball team so you have your point guard you have your shooting forward you have your small forward you have your center xyz you got the bench you got the trainer you got the gm so i think it's it's been a cool overlap in that sense i think that we found our voice within all of this to understand that you know, Mike C handles what it is that we need him to handle. Um, you know, extended people in our teams, like our marketing directors, our you know our you know our photographers. Everyone feels like their ideas are being seen in a in a really cool format. Um, and we all play our position really well. I feel like I think with the where we do butt heads is probably like at our live events when you're scrambling in the um, heat of the moment for like, like 15 <laughs> minutes to opening of the gallery and you're still putting up pictures on the wall or you don't know what <laughs> um, you know where how the projector is going to be set up. I think I think that that comes into the the, the mix, but I think, again, being at the age range that we are and, and understanding how we're, we're really comfortable with ourselves, I think it's more of a, of a competitive butting heads in sort of like a brother and sister way yeah, of just kind of this like, you know, just like irking each other. But it's, uh, it's, it's, that's where it comes down to be, like Steve said, family um, and, and really trying to just like, you know, rock with each other as much as possible. It's definitely a brotherhood. Um, I definitely, that's the main thing that I could take away from this. I, I don't even, I can't even recall really us like, that's what Buddy heads, like, crazy, really. really like, it's, every, like, it's like a nah. Like, we just more or less like, you really want to do that? Yeah. It's more or less like a shrug, like, you sure? Which is, and, which is super fortunate because, you know, like, obviously you start stuff with your homies and, you know, you're, you're bound to butt heads. Yeah. But I think the reason why Six Street Dreams is super successful is because all three of us um, and the team that we have, we really stay intact with each other and we're all honest with each other. It's about um, communication, you know. Right. We, we, if you properly communicate something to someone, you know, it will never be taken as, like, you know, you're butting heads. I, I think we've learned how to, like, properly communicate with each other. Like, you know, we don't just curse each other out for no reason. I mean, <laughs> me and my other job, like, oh, wait, maybe, <laughs> maybe tomorrow. I'm going to get um, you. I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, communication is key, uh, especially when you have, a, a like, a business uh, with someone that, you know, you plan to make it a lifetime. So... Yeah, you have to learn how to talk to people, and we definitely care. We we all great was raised with you know really good mothers, and then we all are super respectable, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Do you think you guys could go around and just describe on a very like microscopic level your guys' favorite moments? Like less so like oh favorite moment is just bringing together community, more so like hey first gallery show, yeah. first print that we or first print run we did. Mike, let's start with you. I would say uh, my first like. One moment that I'll never forget is actually doing the show in New York City um, and collabing with Staple and Jeff Staple. Issue three. Uh, issue three. Um, Jeff Staple is someone that I looked up to like my whole life in terms of like, you know, what he's done for culture and, you know, to come and actually 
activate and have his stuff in in our magazine and have him part of our show and at the same time let you know people that we looked up to like all our lives sitting in the line at the show and you like actually let 13th witness in or so, you, so you bad, left a son in the oh game like you, these are like kind of things are just like you, oh my damn this is, so, so 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 backstory on the on speaking to mike's uh, reference in terms of issue three that was the show that got shut down in 15 minutes because there were 600 people around the block um and that's when we realized that that was our first show in new york and i remember even mike geeking out when we uh were putting the magazine together and we got the the the, the vector files from from jeff and his team and we we're just like, yo, like we we're just really about to throw, you know, the pigeon in, into the magazine. <laughs> like we're gonna put the bird shit in the magazine. <laughs> we had to put the, we had to put the bird shit. In and, and backstory, to, and backstory to that again, why it was such a special moment um, is because. I remember when we printed issue one um, and we were having this conversation about, like, okay, cool, like, okay, we're, we're going to do this. Um, we had the conversation collectively and I remember specifically speaking to Steve, I was just like, okay, cool. Like, if you were going to put this in any, ma in, any in, in any store in New York right now that you could walk into and just, like, hand it to somebody, I said, like, what store would you pick? I, put, I said Reed Space immediately. Reed Space. And, and we all had that thought. So I think speaking to Mike, that was a manifestation of that moment for him. I think and so. We can speak yeah. about yeah. The last con last piece of context, I was definitely one of those streetwear kids hanging out in Reed Space like for hours, like you know, because three sixteen had their office like right across the street from Reed Space. Um, I used to post up in there and like you know that was the cool spot to hang out and like they actually didn't like kick you out for like wanting to like post up and be a part of this vibe. And I lived in Queens, so like you know going back to Queens is like going back to Africa. It's mad far, and so like Reed Space was one of those places that was. One of the one of the most welcoming introductions into streetwear culture for me. So, being able to come back to you know with something in my hand that I actually you know not not only that I, I created with these guys and it represented culture and all this other cool stuff with it. Like you know like this is I'm from New York and like I'm I can actually you know be a part of this. So then that's when when Eric said the first store, I was like, why do you even ask me this question? Do we go into respace first? And then, like, obviously, with Jeff, everything with Jeff Stable, what he represents for, you know, everything with streetwear culture and then, you know, us being, you know, like just, you know, from that era. I mean, and, it just meant the world. Understanding, like, the multifaceted approach that you can take to branding, storefront, creative agency, the little chairs, you know, design firm. That really made us understand that you can take an idea and just really build it into something bigger than it, it was. So what's your what's your moment, though? You have to let us know my moment. My moment. Hmm, what was my moment? Um... My moment is definitely uh, the Apple Talk. Uh, we did our first Apple Talk um, at the uh, Soho Apple Store. And then um, George Lopez was uh, opening up right before us, which was insanely random. And I will never forget how nervous I was um, that day. I mean, I literally felt the butterflies in my stomach. You know, I couldn't, like, drink any so, water. So context, George Lopez is doing an Apple Talk, and he mm. probably has... The this, this space probably could fit, like, you know, about, like, 150 people comfortably. Mm. He probably the had about, like... 50 people in the room. Um, but at the time that we walked into it, and it's kind of speaking to Steve's story, we had, a, there was already sort of like this quenu of people that were sort of like on the outskirts of the of the steps. Plethora. Above, uh, uh, waiting to kind of get into the next talk, which was the Street Dreams talk. Um, yeah, so maybe you could speak into going into the into the green room. They're going into the green room. So we've already been hanging out in the green room for maybe like about 15 minutes, you know, waiting, to, uh, waiting for George, Les, George Lopez to finish up and uh, wrap his shit up. Don and, Cheeto uh, was back there. Don Cheeto approaches us and then he's looking at us like, you know, what are you guys doing here? I was like, dude, this is Don Cheadle, and I can't even, like, speak to this man right now because it went from being, like, uh, 100 people outside to when we went out, 350 people were at the Soho Apple Store. Just, like, Apple mobbed store. the Apple Store. And they were just mobbing an Apple Store. And then, like, George Lopez was low-key sick, but, you know, I love him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so he came in, It was funny because he came into the back, and he was looking at us crazy, like, who the fuck are these people, like, <laughs> waiting to, like, listen to some... Who the who are y'all, basically? But yes. it was amazing because that overlap of... He did look out of sideways. Right? No, he, he was, was like, just like, yo, this is crazy. He was but like, it was what's happening But here? it was more like he was just... He was that perplexed, was cool. you know? I mean, like, that, mo that was one of the moments, I mean... And then we went on to have the Apple Talk, and then that was when we met the dude from the New York Times. Yeah, and that's where the, the we got springboarded yeah. to our New York Times article that uh, we were featured in 2015, which really solidified and, and really opened up the floodgates for people to understand what but we did. George Lopez was the beacon, though. So yeah. if it wasn't for George Lopez, we probably wouldn't <laughs> exist in the first place. So thank you, George Lopez, and, uh, for everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right, not that's to take awesome. up too much time, but I'm, I'm going to say that I think my special moment and the thing that really stands out the most is, is still something that continuously happens. It's... um. Seeing people come, for example, I guess I'll put it into context for art galleries, is seeing people come and seeing their work on, on the walls or having people thumb through a magazine or, you know, hit us up with a comment that, that, that that's saying that, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, can I work for y'all? Can I shoot the, you know, the next campaign and whatnot? So I think it's the special moments of seeing people interact with what it is that we're putting out there. 
Um, so th- I think that that's an ongoing thing. We go into every show where we're, uh, we have the butterflies in our stomach. We're not thinking that anybody's going to show up because we keep our expectations super low super so that we're, we're experiencing that with the people there and sort of are enjoying the moment. So mm-hmm. that's the joyous thing, I think, is, is what really stands out to me. It's, it's, it's those special moments of seeing people come in, um, having you know gallery owners tell us that they've never checked so many out-of-state IDs for a gallery show because people will flock to certain things that we do in certain cities. So I think that that's what it is. It's, 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 it's seeing people still support this. Um, that still mind boggles me and keeps me humble and making sure that we do as much as we can to sustain this brand and, and keep pushing forward to to tell these stories. It definitely never leaves, by the way. No, never. I mean, you, I mean so never cool. leaves, meaning that you never think somebody's going to show up. <laughs> and and yeah. also the combination of when people do show up and then the the constant emotion of, like, the San Francisco show was another great example. I mean, that we'd never seen anything like that before. And, and That was you know, issue seven. That yeah. was issue seven. I mean, as a constant reminder, when we did issue five, you know, we had the floor shaking in the middle of a Voss. I mean, and then these, these people are partying and, and celebrating life at an art show because they feel a part of something. You know, I mean, you don't... Like, I'm talking about it now, still gives me goosebumps, and that happens. 